All right, men, welcome to today's episode, Jesus, the Ultimate Man. So we've got Christmas coming up, and I've just been really studying the life of Jesus a little more, and would love to share kind of the things that I've been learning. So I want to start off with the Strongman Win. This is from our, our group in the Strongman system. Uh, so this is one of our gentlemen. He says, before we went to bed, I had a few moments alone and did a state fair. That's one of the models we used to kind of look at our thoughts about ending the night with sex. It was a prospective state fair rather than one looking in the rear view mirror. I'd never done that before. I wanted to come to it strong and solid. My thoughts, you are the woman I choose to share my life, my body, and my soul with. I choose to give me to you. I choose you over everyone else. You might consider those intentions too. Those are great. That's a great way to approach sex. In any event, I did the state fair quickly and I felt an increase in personal confidence and approach sex with a type of confidence I haven't for a while. There's been sex between us off and on for a while, but this was one of the best, mostly because I felt like we were more connected before and after. Outstanding. So a great job. You know, this is what we do. We uh, we create these incredible marriages, these incredible connections. A lot of it has to do with our own strength and confidence. That's why we talk about get strong, get attractive, get that strong, joyful, and intimate marriage. So in your life, who are the, your examples of manhood? You know, this is really what the strong man system and strong men, strong marriages is about, is becoming better men, stronger men. So in my life, my dad is a great example of, of manhood. So he really embodied, I think, kindness, still does, uh, gentleness, being loving, someone who's just there, solid there for me. I really appreciate that about him. Uh, my maternal grandfather was more of kind of a, a strong kind of guy, um, very dedicated to our church, uh, kind of a disciplinarian growing up. I didn't see that as much, but his my, my aunts and uncles did. Uh, funny, you know, joking around kind of guy. He used to, uh, he had a fake tooth. He'd like take it out and you know, make it look like it was sticking out, joke around with us like that. Uh, funny guy. Uh, my maternal grandfather, he was funny too. Like it was always kind of saying sort of inappropriate stuff, <laughs> but a uh, funny guy, a little bit more reserved. And uh, he had a harder time expressing love. It wasn't until actually after he passed away that I was able to appreciate from my grandma just how much he cared about uh, us and um, was really proud of what, what we had done. On a more kind of, you, you know, funny note like or someone in movies so rocky is actually a good example of manhood to me so somebody who is you know he's humble he's able to learn he's also very dedicated right keeps pushing through failure uh he's strong he's kind okay very dedicated to his family a good husband all right so good examples of manhood are kind of hard to find in in movies but i think he he's a good one <laughs> Also, on my on my mission, there was one point where I was just feeling so tired of walking around these streets, um, trying to tell people about Jesus. People weren't listening, and a phrase from Rocky came to mind: "I didn't hear no bell." So this is when he is uh, he's fighting Tommy Gunn actually in in Rocky Five, and he stands back up after getting beat down, you know, hundreds of times. <laughs> Says, "I didn't hear no bell." So it gets up and, and uh, keeps fighting. So that was, again, a reminder to me to keep going. But really, who we want to look to as, as Christian guys, or at least for me, who I want to look to, you know, Jesus is the ultimate example of a man, like the ultimate man. So I've been reading through Matthew in the New Testament and a few other places in the New Testament to really try to understand the character of Jesus better. And I've, I've found some interesting insights that I wanted to share. So one of those is... Jesus, you know, he's an outstanding leader, and he did that by being a great follower first. So in John 5, 19, uh, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but wait what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. So in other words, he was just trying to do what God told him to. Uh, you know, some of the people in our church say that his a will was swallowed up in the Father's will. In other words, he kind of let God really guide his life and got to know God at that deep level and really followed and became like God. Okay? In Matthew chapter 3, the first thing we really see Jesus do is go and be baptized. 
right? Which he did to obey one of God's commandments. So he said, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. When John the Baptist is like, whoa, you know, you're a perfect man. You don't need to be baptized, right? You don't need to have sins washed away. And Jesus says, no, I'm, I'm following what God asked me to do. So again, showing that good example of, of following, following what Jesus uh, or what God had asked him to do. So guys, as leaders of our homes and leaders in our own lives, one of the best things that we can do is be a follower of Jesus, really be a student of, of him. You know, with Christmas coming up, this is a great time to really dig into, you know, the New Testament in particular. If, if you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Book of Mormon also, you know, um, Doctrine and Covenants, these can be places to just understand who Jesus is much better. Okay, So, you know, study his life and the lives of other good men, right? We, we become great leaders by being great followers of God, of Jesus first, you know, if you're a Christian person, and then looking to other examples of men who are, you know, our contemporaries who are living in our same time who we can, you know, follow. Another big breakthrough for me in reading this time around and recently is that Jesus was actually very confrontational. <laughs> so I think sometimes in in our church and I think in other Christian churches, we can think, oh, like being a follower of Jesus means you just let people walk all over you. Like there's the, the Beatitudes say, turn the other cheek, right? Like let people, sometimes gets interpreted as let people do whatever they want to you, right? That's how Jesus was. But the truth is Jesus wasn't like that. Like he's actually very confrontational. Yeah, if you read through looking for it, you're going to find it everywhere. Like in Matthew, it is everywhere. <laughs> so Jesus, he really had no issue calling people out. None. Right. So that quote from John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist says, hey, you know, I don't need to baptize you. And Jesus just corrects him. Right. Well, no, like I need to do this. Okay. He asked people to give up more than they expected to follow him. So right when he calls his disciples, he asked them to just walk right away from all their jobs. Okay. That's a hard ask, but he was willing to do it. Right. That's a type of confrontation. Okay. The rich man asking him to give away all his goods. Right? Sell what you have and give to the poor and come follow me. Right? That's a big ask. He, when uh, someone comes and says, hey, let me follow you, but I need to you know, bury my family first. Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead and come follow me. In other words, you know, he's asking a lot, which is a confrontation. Okay? He called out lack of faith in his disciples. So you know, he often said to his disciples, oh, ye of little faith. Okay, when Peter's walking out to him on the water, you know, why did you have little faith? When he's in the boat, okay, and the storm's coming, he asks, why do you have such little faith? Again, that's confrontational. That's saying, hey, like, there's room for you to grow here. It, probably the biggest place we see him calling people out is the scribes and Pharisees. So, Early on in Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, Jesus heals the, the paralytic. And there are uh, scribes and, and Pharisees there that are saying, oh, like, who is he that he thinks he can, he can uh, um, forgive sin? And so Jesus says, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Right? That's a very clear confrontation. Right? There's a full chapter where he says, woe unto ye scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He says that over and over. To me, one of the, the strongest ones he says is that they were whited sepulchers, which are like tombs, right? Which appear beautiful outwards, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. <laughs> so that's a pretty clear confrontation, right? Calling somebody out there, all right? Another good one, Matthew 23, 27, the same scribes and Pharisees are saying, why do you transgress? Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? Jesus responds, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So very clear, very clear confrontation, right? In Matthew chapter 15, he calls Peter Satan. He says, get, ye, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou savorest not the things of God, but the things of men. So he was very willing to speak his mind, to correct as he saw needed, okay? He wasn't overly like gentle with these corrections either. <laughs> so 
this was kind of, a, again, a surprise for me to kind of look through this and see this clearly that, wow, you know, Jesus, he was a confrontational guy. He did not shy away from it at all. And that's something that I, I can work on myself, right? Jesus, he also had an extremely strong sense of self. Okay? He had no doubt who he was or what his purpose was. And how did he get that? He spent a lot of time with his father to understand that purpose. Okay? Early on in, in Matthew 2, he goes out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to really just kind of be with uh, his father more, which prepared him to have those temptations from Satan. And again, talking about, you know, confrontational and, and standing up to someone. So Satan comes to tempt him and, you know, he just quotes scripture to him. Eventually he says, you know, just get out of here, right? So no issue, you know, standing up for himself, standing up against evil. He called himself Lord of the Sabbath. He called himself greater than the temple in Matthew 12. Okay, clear sense of who he was. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So again, no issue. Like he knew who he was. He didn't apologize for it, right? And he was kind of cautious, but that was, again, directed by, by God when to sort of be more direct about who he was. But he knew all along who he was. There was no doubt. The other thing that Jesus did is he spent a lot of his time serving the people who were more kind of on the fringe or outcasts of society. I just uh, started recently reading a book called, or finished a book called Falling Upward that kind of drew attention to this idea too about how, you know, that's really where Jesus was spending his time. It wasn't with the elites of society, you know, the, the scribes and Pharisees or whatever. It was with people that were more on the fringe. He so Jesus he really had very little interest in social standing, basically none. <laughs> so if if he was interested in it, he would not have been you know calling the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites. He would not have been hanging out with the people he was hanging out with. Okay. In Matthew nine it says he spent his time with publicans and sinners. So he ate with publicans and sinners. So publicans being tax collectors, very looked down upon, just like today IRS right. <laughs> If you work for the IRS, sorry, but yeah, people don't like tax collectors very much. Um, and, and sinners, which you know, is a funny thing for them to say, right? Because we're all sinners. And Jesus kind of helped draw their attention to that as well. That, you know, the whole need no physician. You know, I came to the, to the sick, the whole need no physician. You know, even though those guys also clearly needed a physician, they just didn't uh, see it. But anyway, that's who he spent his time with, right? Publicans and sinners. He also spent a lot of time with women. You know, if we look through the uh, the scriptures, a lot of the people that he healed were women. You know, he spent a lot of time with uh, with Mary and Martha. Um, at that time, so I looked this I looked this up. This is on a site called Jews for Jesus, which uh, it just gave some historical context. But at that time, you know, women and men they rarely talked to each other, and that wasn't commandment again this is just kind of the tradition that had been built up by the rabbis over time um, also women they rarely left their home they, they didn't really go shopping much um, they couldn't testify in court so basically they were you know placed at a lower spot in society but didn't bother jesus right he went around he spent time with them uh, he healed them he let you know, women come and, you know, the woman that anoints him and washes it or washes his feet with her, with her tears. Okay. Uh, also, you know, the, the Gentile woman is a good example where uh, this is in Matthew 15, uh, 27, where this woman comes and asks Jesus to heal her, uh, her child who had a devil. And Jesus says, you know, it's not me to give, um, to give, uh, you know, scraps to the, the dogs, right? And then the woman says, well, you know, even the dogs eat the crumbs of the table. And then Jesus heals her. That's another thing Jesus did kind of with that confrontation idea where he would sometimes uh, sort of challenge people a little bit and say, you know, they wanted something. He'd kind of give them a little challenge and then see if they would meet it. You know, so this woman did, you know, she kind of kept coming. She kept asking and Jesus granted that to her, you know, healing her daughter. Or her, her child. 
Another people, another group he spent a lot of time with were lepers, right? He healed a lot of lepers who were definitely outcasts of society at that time. The centurion, you know, a, a Roman soldier, again, like the, the Jewish people in general didn't really like them. Okay. Um, so, you know, if, if you look, he just spent so much time with all these marginalized or, you know, kind of looked down upon groups, Samaritans, right? The Samaritan woman, you know, he didn't, he just didn't go with the, the cultural flow, right? He didn't buy into the prejudices and, and hatred and, you know, looking down on other people. He didn't do any of that. He saw himself as a servant. That's another thing that I, I really have been focusing on lately is he says, you know, the greatest among you will be the servant. And he was really the example of that. So quick summary and some of my takeaways, but I definitely encourage you, you know, especially with Christmas coming up, if you're a Christian person, take the time and look through, you know, go through the New Testament. Uh, if you're a member of the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints, you know, go through the Book of Mormon and just look for, you know, who was Jesus? What are his character traits? What can I take away to, you know, be a better man? Because he's our example, right? He's the example of the ultimate man. So again, quick summary of my takeaways. So Jesus, he was a great leader by being a great follower. So for me, I can use God, Jesus, and other good men as guides in my life. Jesus, he was confrontational. So I can take a stand for myself and what's right, even when it's unpopular. That's one that I'm growing into. I'm getting better, but I definitely uh, can do more of that. Jesus, he had an extremely strong sense of self. And I can remember for myself that I'm a son of God. And because of that, I have infinite worth and infinite potential. Along with that, that I'm enough as I am. You know, that's one that I'm working on right now, that I don't need a certain amount of money or a certain amount of clients or a certain amount of you know, whatever, those are the ones that kind of haunt me the most <laughs> is, you know, trying to, to make a certain amount of money. Um, but just remembering that I'm enough as I am. Also, Jesus, he wasn't worried about social standing, but he spent his time in the service of those who needed it. So I can look for ways to serve other people. And, and even, you know, if I want to be a good leader in what I'm doing, trying to help men, best way is to be a great servant. That's a big takeaway for me. I can also look for people who are kind of on the outcast or marginalized. What came to me personally was to you know look at the homeless people. There's quite a few homeless people here in Southern California. How can I be more of service to them versus you know kind of looking down on them or judging them? Right. So that was kind of my personal takeaway on that. All right, man. So use this time, use this this month, these these next few weeks to really study the life of Jesus and other good men, you know, as your examples. All right, man, stay strong. We'll see you next episode.